Hi, and welcome to my podcast, Jack to the Future. From science and inventions to pollution and recycling, I talk about what's changing in the world, the future, and how we can help with that. Every month I'll talk about a different future theme. For example, the future of science, tech, sustainability, reading, music and all sorts of other ones. The future of everything. Did you know? You can find me on Facebook and Instagram as Jade to the Future and on YouTube as Jack to the Future. Follow me to get behind the scenes info, access to the previews about my next episodes and much, much more. This is episode 2 of Jack to the Future's new season, STEM to the Future. Today, I'm bringing you the first part of two episodes on the future of energy, and I talk with electrical engineer Gavin Rahm about his job, how roller coasters work, why electricity can be dangerous, and of course, we discuss the possibilities of electricity in the future. Any Back to the Future fans out there? I hope so. I even managed to ask a few questions about Doc Brown and the time-travelling DeLorean in the context of engineering and electricity. It was really fun, walking through lots of hypotheses about how he managed it. If only it was real. (laughs) Imagine a life without electricity. You couldn't even begin imagining it, right? And I mean, literally. You can't start imagining because you you can't listen into this podcast because you don't have a computer, smartphone or speaker to listen to it on. It was invented more than 200 years ago and is very important nowadays, but we need to be careful how we use it though. Research shows that it might be the solution to the future of sustainable energy if we can produce it in a greener way. Before we begin though, my younger listeners, do you even know how electricity is generated? I didn't really. The main ways that electricity is generated is from fossil fuels, hydroelectricity and nuclear energy. Fossil fuel power is the most common around the world. Fossil fuel power burns coal, oil or natural gas to make heat and then steam from the fire turns turbines like big fans that produce electricity. These sort of plants have been used for a long time because they're reliable and quite cheap to build. I'll put a link of the BBC Teach video in the description if you'd like some more information. So why can't we just carry on like this? Well, the ambition for changing how we generate energy is a big one. By 2050, Europe hopes to be carbon neutral, or you may have heard people talking about us reaching net zero. So what does that mean exactly? So at the moment, most power is made by using fossil fuels. When fossil fuels are burnt, they release gases into the air, mainly carbon dioxide, which is what we call the greenhouse gas. The greenhouse gas is making our planet hotter and caused in climate change. As well as this, the Earth is running out of fossil fuels. You may have heard of people talk about how we need to reduce our carbon footprint. That means the total greenhouse gas emissions caused by something that we use or do. For example, any car journeys you make, how and where your clothes were made, what rubbish you throw away, even what you have for dinner tonight, and where all that food comes from and how it was made. All of these things add to our carbon footprint. So I'm talking about the future of energy, and specifically how we generate electricity because it's so important that we find alternatives to make sure that we reduce or stop polluting the atmosphere with carbon dioxide. But it's not just about new ways of generating electricity, it's also about how we can use it differently. So like in cars or other transport, to hit our houses and run factories. It's a huge topic and obviously as I'm only nine, I'm not suggesting that I could cover it all or have the answers. The idea of these episodes is to give you a sneak peek of what could happen in the future. Have you got any ideas about the future of electricity? I'd like to introduce my special guest today, Gavin Rahm, who is an electrician and electrical engineer, STEM ambassador, volunteer at Winchester Science Centre and a member of the IET. That's a lot of jobs. Hi Gav, thanks for being here. Hi Jack, thank you very much for having me. The lucky thing about those lots of jobs is that they all kind of mean the same thing. So being a member of the IET, Institute of Engineering Technology, we put ourselves forward to be volunteers. They call us schools liaison officers. But one of the requirements of being a schools liaison officer is that you need to have been a STEM ambassador for at least a year beforehand. So you have to take it upon yourself to go and sign up with the Winchester Science Centre and do some training to enable you to work well with young people and it's really two jobs in one i'm not over one i do get to sleep now and again (laughs) there's lots of different jobs that an electrical engineer can do and you're an electrician too please can you give me three examples of what you do so that my listeners know 
Okay. Yes. Engineering in general is a very, very wide subject, as you've just found out recently. Initially, I trained as an electrician and they call us electrical installation engineers. As an electrician, you train to learn electrical design. So you learn how to design electrical installations. You learn about how to design lighting and power, cable sizes, prevent fire and prevent accidents happening through electric shock. This can be working in houses, wiring houses. It can be working in factories, installing machines and the wiring for machines. Or it could be in hospitals or laboratories. As an electrician, you will then, using equipment, various pieces of equipment, you will test that it is safe, that it won't catch fire, that the protective devices like MCBs, RCDs, residual current devices, things like that, fuses, which protect electronic items. I've heard of RCDs, but not the other one you mentioned. They all work in the right time frame to cut the electricity off and stop people getting hurt. But there are other parts. So you could also have been an electrical engineer, so have gone to university and done a degree. And if you'd have done that, you'd be involved solely in the design of electrical or electronic systems. Okay, and that could be power distribution for railway systems, for domestic installations or industry, or internally, individual buildings. Another route of engineering is building services design. In that side of things, you will learn how to design electrical installations as well as the heating and hot water. So you'll, you'll learn how to design a building as a whole. So it branches into various different directions. And also there's a lot of crossover too. Yeah, I agree that there's lots of different parts of being an electrician because it's very hard to accomplish. How hard is it to be one? It depends on what sort of person you are, I think. A responsibility of an electrician is to train the younger generation with apprentices and you train them up. To become an electrician, you have to do a lot of on-the-job training. I really enjoyed doing this. I enjoyed my apprenticeship and I enjoyed bringing young people along. The hardest thing is trying to explain to somebody what's in your head and help them to understand. Does that help? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Engineers need to be good problem solvers. Have you solved any complicated problems before? Yes. Part of my role is problem solving. I used to be quite good at fault finding and that's part of an electrician's job. One time we was called out to a restaurant in a theme park where they were having problems with high electricity bills and their lights were dimming. Bulbs were blowing quite regularly. So we went out to investigate and we were having a real problem trying to pin this problem down. Couldn't really quite put our finger on what was happening. What happened? It turns out that right next to the restaurant, there was a roller coaster and they'd recently been doing some work on the roller coaster. And one day I was working near the substation, looking at the electrical meter for the restaurant. And as the roller coaster came past, and the brakes activated, the electricity meter started flying around uncontrollably. And it was basically running this guy's electricity bill up. And what happened in the recent works to upgrade the brakes on the roller coaster because it used these electromagnetic brakes, it was connected to the power supply of the restaurant. And when the brakes activated, it was basically drawing all the electricity available and basically robbing the restaurant of its electricity to activate the brake. And unfortunately, the restaurant owner was paying the bill for this. Yeah, I bet he wasn't very happy about that. No. <laughs> so to confirm our findings, we had to get a special piece of equipment and connect it to the power supply to get the evidence. So you get a graph, a readout showing spikes in the voltage and current at specific times. <laughs> Did the roller coaster people give him some money? Yeah, he was given a refund of their astronomically high electricity bills. Yeah, that is really that is really clever of you to solve the problem. And it was such a coincidence that you came in there at the exact time the roller coaster came past and then you figured out the meter I went all crazy and then you solved the problems yes Jack um, I wouldn't say it was clever probably more luck than anything yeah if it hadn't so 
If the I haven't gone to that exact second. Yes, you know, he knew that something was wrong with regards to being charged for his electricity and he felt he was paying way too much, which he was, but couldn't quite figure out why. And it was a total mystery. So when we came up with the solution or, or the discovery that yeah, he was quite surprised, as everybody was. Yeah. Just so my listeners know, how did the electromagnet, all the brakes sort of stuff work? So there are various different braking systems that are used on roller coasters. I'm no expert, but looking at various different stem topics, there's a range of different braking systems, which are you're similar you'll find on a car with regards to pads and wheels and what have you. But modern roller coasters do use electromagnetic brakes where they have a plate attached to the bottom of the roller coaster car itself. And then there's a electromagnet attached underneath the track which is i think you've actually created something yourself haven't you at home when you made an electromagnet yeah we watched a video from the royal institution about how magnets are really useful for lots of things Mm. um, like controlling plasma inside a nuclear fusion reactor and also a really cool video they used a magnet a battery and a copper wire which is what we did and it's like a mini electromagnet if you could say that yeah yeah. Can you remember how you made that magnet? Didn't you have a battery yeah, and then it's you a battery wrapped... it's like a circle magnet on the bottom and a copper wire. That's right. So you wrapped a coil of wire around if you make it into like a like a C shape and then you connect bottom of it to the magnet and the top of it to like the top of the battery. Mm. And then then it like creates a circuit. Creates a circuit and a magnetic field. Yeah, and then it just spins around. Yes, got you. Yes. It's quite cool. No, it is cool. That is a cool experiment. I've done something similar, actually, with we fixed a magnet to the top of the battery, attached two paper clips either side of the battery, and then we used some insulated copper wire, which we'd made into a coil, and that sat on top of the paper clip, and then that used to spin. Yeah. But yeah, back to the electromagnet. So in the same way that you created your electromagnet with the battery and the coil of wire, even though that was on a small scale, it's the same principle. So a larger electromagnet would be a coil of wire wrapped around a core, a metal core, generally an iron core, and that creates a magnetic field. When that magnetic field is energised, it attracts the metal. So so as a roller coaster passes over that electromagnet, the electromagnet will try and stop the roller coaster. It's trying to attract that piece of metal and in effect it will slow. Because it's an electromagnet, it needs lots of electricity to power the magnet. It does. Yeah, so it it took the electricity from like his his restaurant and used it for the brake on the roller coaster. That's correct. It created a surge. We call those inductive loads. So anything where we were creating an electric field, like an electromagnet. And the characteristics of those loads is that they tend to suck the electricity through the network. They create what we call the lead they lead the voltage so if you use water as an example and you had like a tap running in your house your tap was the restaurant for example and then your neighbor had a bigger tap and they turned on their tap full blast which would rob you of all your electricity that essentially be the roller coaster's electromagnet yeah and it would suck it would draw the majority of that water it's a through. Little bit like when we're in the shower and you turn the tap on or turn the bath water on the shower goes cold Yes. So it sucks like the like the hotness from it. To the yeah. Bath if you're using the hot water. That's exactly the same principle. Yeah. It makes you wonder if people do it on purpose, doesn't it, Jack? Yeah. Sometimes <laughs> like dad's in it, and then I purposely turn the tap on to wash my hands. <laughs> I'm learning about electronic circuits at school and how if you put too much power through a thin wire in a circuit, the wire will actually explode. Have you ever hurt yourself whilst doing something like? based yes unfortunately it is a hazard of the job although it is a hazard we try and minimize of course so what you created in your experiment was a fusible link very similar to what we use in the industry or we used to use semi-enclosed rewirable fuses in houses years ago and it was the same principle when there was a fault on the house the fuse link would heat up and break thus cutting off the electricity but they weren't very effective So nowadays we use different types of protective devices, trip switches and things like that, which activate a lot quicker. We've got one of those in under our stairs cupboard. You have to flick it back on if it blows. 
Yes, with regards to hurting myself, I received a few electric shocks. Ow, did it hurt? They're very painful, very painful indeed. And, you know, in, in, in some cases they can be quite light and don't do you a lot of damage. And in some cases they can cause you a lot of injury if not kill you. So electricity is very dangerous. Yeah, well, it must be careful. With regards to, I think, hurting myself at work with electricity probably was my own fault and down to complacency. What does that mean? We have a set procedure of locking protective devices off and making circuits safe. And I think over time, when you become familiar with your job and you do it day in, day out, and you tend to become a bit more relaxed about what you're doing, you know, and then you might forget to lock a breaker off or something like that. And then when you forget to do that and you go and work on something, someone else can come along and switch trip switch on and energize the circuit again, which is one example of what's happened to me in the past. And it's not very pleasant, but I can thankfully say I've never been injured that bad. Badly. So I always electric shocks always get me worried about electricity and that's why yeah like you said they use fuses because they explode on purpose to like stop the electricity from going anywhere else because it helps you stop the electric current if there's a problem with it yeah it could hurt you but yeah like you said they didn't used to be as good and they used to take a bit longer. They did, actually, and they took considerably longer. Some fuses, you know, if it was a minor fault, take a couple of weeks to blow. Right. And, the, and the cables could get hot in the house and that sort of thing. And that's why we stopped using that type of fuse for domestic purposes. So in houses nowadays, we try and use trip switches. So modern regulations stipulate that we should be using um, trip switches, which are miniature circuit breakers. And they generally work off of a bimetallic strip. Do you know about... No, not really. I'm not... I know what trip switches are, but not what's inside them really. So let's say someone's put the kettle on, but maybe the washing machines are on and the lights are on. Sometimes the circuit's overloaded and everything goes off because one of the switches automatically switches itself off, stopping him on being hurt. You're absolutely right. There's two ways it can work. So a brief example, bimetallic strip is two similar pieces of metal that react differently to temperature. Okay, so one could be a steel and one could be copper. And it's the same way as your heating thermostat might work in your house which turns the heating on and off when the temperature in your room changes. So yeah. when an electrical current passes through that bimetallic strip, the weaker part, the copper part will bend and then that will tap the off switch, essentially. Yeah. Okay, so the metal will heat up, bend, and then it turns the circuit off. It moves the contacts apart. That's one way it works. The other way is using magnetism. So there's an electromagnetic coil in the trip switch and... So if you can imagine in a trip switch, you've got two surfaces that are touching and the electricity flows through those two surfaces, like the ends of two cables. And if a large surge, so a fault current that's created when something goes wrong in your electrical circuit, where the kettle draws a large surge of electricity, that will create a magnetic field in your trip switch and it will pull those cables apart, those contacts. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They have a thermal cutout and electromagnetic cutout. Okay. So yeah, things are much safer now. Yeah. It's lucky that we've got better sort of devices that help us not get hurt with electricity. See you guys. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Jack. And it is paramount in the electrical industry. You know, a lot of effort goes into protecting people, homeowners and end users against electric shock. Do you know the film Back to the Future? Yes. I love Back to the Future. Yeah, it's my, it's my favourite film. Yeah, but I need my podcast after it. Yeah. Would you say if Doc, Doc Brown's an electrical engineer? I would say Doc Brown's an electrical engineer. You know, everybody knows about the flux capacitor. Yeah. Uh, which Don't creates, uh, is it 1.21 gigawatts? Yeah, it's 88 miles per hour. What do you think that flux capacitor does? How do you think they travel through time? Um, I'm not really sure, to be honest. Do you think that maybe it creates a magnetic field? Mm -hmm, probably a wormhole or a tunnel probably does create a wormhole to be honest through time brilliant <laughs> how do you think he got power from the lightning to charge the delorean that's a good question how did he get the power or how did he prevent the delorean being blown to a million pieces that's yeah question. how did he prevent the DeLorean from going? <laughs> yeah. yeah i think it used some sort of well wiring because you, you can get lightning rods which convert lightning into electricity maybe you use the heat shunt what's that a heat shunt is like a big radiator 
So maybe the electricity passed yeah, through a big radiator, dissipated all the heat so the car didn't burn. Yeah, <laughs> but you probably might have used that, I don't know really. Who knows? It doesn't, they don't show you how to do the electrics in the film. Mm. Otherwise, if they did get it accurately, then we'd be able to do them in real life. And the people who created the film were ge- geniuses. I love the fact you're trying to look for an answer there, Jack. I think that's brilliant. You are an engineer in the making, for sure. Already working through it in your head. <laughs> love it. Thank you. I, I don't know. I can only speculate. I, I mean, attracting the lightning in itself, he's picked the highest point, hasn't he? Yeah. The, the most exposed point. So lightning, being an electrical charge, it's obviously generated high up in the cloud clouds and then he's attracted to earth as the same way all electricity is attracted to earth and he's picked the highest point so the lightning's guaranteed to strike that point if you look at the setup that he's used it's very very similar to what you would see on a bumper car isn't it where if you go to the fair and you see the bumper cars yeah. and then they have a tall electrical conductor yeah and they? once i went on the bunker cars at Butlins, and it was like i saw a spark and it was like a string of sparks. It just was like, mm. and went across the top of the board, which was quite cool. Mm. Yeah. So what you're seeing with the sparks is when that conductor's touching the metal grid above, it's not going to stay connected all the time because of the bumper cars bumping around and flying yeah. all over the place. So when that metal hook comes away from the grid, the electricity is still trying to jump down to earth and that's basically what a lightning strike is it's electricity jumping through the air so the sparks that you're seeing are the electricity trying to jump almost like mini lightning strikes really jack a little tip if it's a stormy day and your hair is suddenly stacking it's like standing up run away from the spot you feel standing in because that means lightning's going to strike there yeah it could be or you could try laying flat on the ground try not to be the highest point yeah do you think how we use electricity will change in 30 years time yes i do i think how we use electricity is changing now and it's changing i think more rapidly than we realize where we're using electric vehicles more there's this need for us to produce less carbon for example yeah there is and one of the easiest ways that we can start doing that is by using electric vehicles and we're charging them at home at the moment and in the future we need to have more places we can charge them on the streets in vehicle charging stations like petrol stations. But also there's some research going into what we call dynamic charging, which is similar to how you would charge an electric toothbrush, for example. So is there a way that we can charge electric vehicles from the road using electromagnetic fields? So as you go along. Mm. Never, but I guess they have to dig up the roads and stuff. You know, if you're stopped at the traffic lights, for example, waiting for people to cross rather traffic to move, could there be a coil under the ground to charge your vehicle? That's cool. There's those sorts of things in domestic situations. For example, we're using electricity more with regards to cooking and we're looking at other ways of heating water with solar panels on your roof or yeah. things like that. I expect we'll move away from gas-fired boilers and hobs and rely solely on electric boilers or solar powered heating i wonder if it's sunny enough in england to give you enough electricity to warm your house up in the winter i wanted to say was like you said they might change things like that either they're going to change things to air source heat pumps or they've already there are already air source heat pumps yeah hopefully they're going to change all like the boilers and things to their source heat pump because quite a bit more sustainable from the environment and also better when it uses electricity Mm. the things that they should definitely do is i think they should make things that are more better for the environment less amount of money because at the moment things that are better for the environment are quite a lot of money i think they should decrease the cost for them because then people will buy more of them because it would be you know cheaper but i think the main reason they're quite a lot of money is because they're kind of in a way not actually rare but they're just not a lot of people have these sorts of things especially this year been a lot of costs going up for things like that why do you think that is i agree with you there jack with regards to the less something's produced the more expensive it is you know in manufacturing the more you can repeat that process so if you was producing 100 air source heat pumps it could cost you something like ten thousand pounds for example if you produced a million air source heat pumps that cost 
would come right down. Your price per unit would be a lot less and you could reduce the overall cost. Yeah, and there's a little bit like gold, let's say. You don't have much gold because it's quite rare um, Mm -hmm. and the price is high. But when Mm -hmm. you get lots of that precious thing, the price goes down. Because there's yes. more of the supply in the yeah. world. That's right. The companies can make more money off them because they're selling more. So it's cheaper for them to manufacture them and they can you know, have less of a profit margin per item because of the speed that they're actually selling them. With regards to things like air source heat pumps or ground source heat pumps and things like that, I think where we think they're better, they're not quite there yet because we're not quite there with power generation so all we're doing by using air source heat pumps is we're taking away using the gas boiler locally in our house but we're transferring that to the power station because the the air source heat pump will run on electricity but we'll still be using electricity made in a gas-fired or coal-fired power station do you see what i mean so yeah Yeah, i see what you mean kind of defeats the point they're a good thing in the short term and they'll get better as they become more efficient and more widely used as they're cheaper i think our real problem is the way we generate electricity we're building new nuclear power stations at the moment but is that the answer to our carbon problem what do you think about that jack yeah it might be when you make the thing and you use it in a factory, it might be powered by fossil fuels. Mm, it's yeah. kind of like an infinite loop. Let's say that the factory is powered by electricity, but then what that power used to actually make its electricity, you have to use more electricity, wind power, for those turbines would need electricity. So it's hard, really, to actually get electricity. I'm actually going to interview somebody later on this series who works for a company that uses wood pellets to power the power station rather than coal. So that's really interesting. Maybe that's an alternative. That's it. I can't remember what they measure electricity in. Kilowatt hours. Mm-hmm. Okay. We have a meter in the kitchen which tells us how much we use and it seems like a lot. Dad keeps turning all the lights off in our house. I think your dad and I are very similar in that respect. I don't know how your dad's doing but I'm fighting a losing battle here. He turns the lights off and then he goes back to the meters. He's like, still hot! How is it still hot? <laughs> Hikes in fuel prices are generally due to supply and demand and I do believe there is an issue with supply at the moment. I think oil companies Companies cut back. It's initiated by the oil companies, and the oil companies have cut back due to coronavirus pandemic, I believe it was. So I think it's due to issues with labour and, and not having the staff to produce oil safely. They've scaled back their production. Okay, so they're not making as much because they can't afford to pay as many people to do the job. That's it. So then prices go up. So every country has a certain store as well. So I believe the US released so many million barrels from their store to drive prices down a bit, but it didn't really have much effect. So yeah, I think for the next two years, we're to be expecting high fuel prices. Oh, that's not great, is it? Yeah. How will electrical engineers help with the future of energy? That's a really good question. And there is no clear answer, but electrical engineers, with us using electricity more and more and we can generate electricity in a carbon neutral way and it will be the preferred choice of energy in the end and electrical engineers will be heavily involved in that and they will do a number of things they have been working over the last few years to generate a more efficient systems so for example lighting everything's led lighting now okay it's way more efficient it uses less energy the materials being used are much more advanced now we can make led lights that are extremely thin that fit in a ceiling tile whereas before we used to have to make a gas tube to create light and that in itself polluted the environment because it had toxins in it such as uh, magnesium and things like that so you mentioned air source heat pumps Mm -hmm. use electric motors to pull air through them to create heat in the pipes then pump it into the house using obviously an electric pump solar panels on roofs so with regards to that sort of technology it will always be re-engineered to make it more efficient i think the ultimate goal with regards to electrical engineering is something that's been quite prominent in the news recently. I like to think so. Anyway, the ultimate goal is to produce fusion energy. I think I heard you mention it earlier on. Do you follow the news on what they're doing with the fusion reactors, Jack? Yeah, Dad showed me this. To be honest, I love nuclear fusion reactors. I love the way they combine atoms and split up atoms and things like that. Do you like the fact that they're creating a little yeah. mini sun? Yeah, and I like that they're so huge, but they're yeah. only creating like two atoms or two particles in a matter of seconds and a huge colossal machine has to just do that 
I can't even imagine in the future if we can actually create real objects. Mm. Did you hear about the recent breakthrough in China? It was the longest nuclear fusion time ever. It lasted for 17 minutes. Yes. A world record. Yeah. And then just recently in France, I think they just, I think it was a five minute run, didn't they, where they yeah. generated, yeah. There's two companies I like to work for. CERN. So oh, yeah. I really want to work there because it just seems really, really interesting of all the things they make, that all the experiments. Mm -hmm. Is there anything particular that you like about that? Is it just the fact that they do so many different experiments? Yeah. Is it the wide range? Yeah, it's just the wide range of what they've got and what they can do and also mm. they've got such a big space to do it because the building the CERN building is huge it's humongous it's definitely a good goal to have hopefully you'll go work there save our energy crisis and save the planet yeah <laughs> mm. a lot of sciences obviously are closely related to engineering and are in fact engineering definitely with regards to physics when you're looking at trying to generate power with regards to these new fusion reactors that they're making and process of generating the flux that creates the heat containing that flux in the electromagnetic field yeah that would definitely be a good career path to follow um and it's very very similar to the, how the CERN generator works because obviously the CERN generator is it's a total circle isn't it it's like a donut and the particles that, that fly around that CERN generator naturally would go in a straight line mm -hmm. yeah they would because they use electromagnetic fields so uh, let's say you've got like a ball bearing mm. and then you've got six magnets one cube shape at that side and that side and then you put the ball bearing in the middle it would just float in the middle because it has all the opposites of its um what's the word for it the yeah it has a north pole and a south pole and it attracts yeah, and repels. yeah if it was on the bottom one it can't go up side yeah every single magnet would just make it go the opposite of its direction but it can't go in those directions so it just decides to go to the middle that's so right because all those magnets are the same distance apart aren't they yeah. And they're all the same strength. So they're producing an equal force. Yeah. Pushing on that little ball bearing. So basically there. just hover in the middle. That's of right. Them. Yeah. yeah. Sounds like you're ready to go already. <laughs> I think engineers are essential in the future of electricity because they can use the knowledge they already have and then apply it to newer technology that comes along maybe. It's almost like once you invent something and you have a successful product and then you look at that as a new problem. And that's kind of what engineering is. You have a product, you've invented it and, you know, Know, say like a new battery cell that produces 30 amp hours of energy and then it's like okay well the new problem is how can we make that smaller how can we make that produce more energy how can we make it so that it doesn't produce so much heat so in a lot of cars for example the batteries create a lot of heat and they have to be cooled so that's a problem in itself that engineers need to look at to make batteries work more efficiently they need to be smaller because you think the batteries weigh quite a bit so you're going to fill a car with batteries and the more batteries you put in it the more of the energy and then batteries you've got to use to push that car forward haven't you yeah so if you could make that battery lighter you'll use less of that battery's energy which means that car can travel for further mm -hmm. using less electricity mm. yeah we've got these great products but with these great products comes new problems in how we can make them better and more efficient how can we improve on it it's never ending isn't it you can create an invention that solves one problem and then you end up with another that's always the thought behind engineering yeah. Or maybe you create the problem in your own mind. Maybe you're a perfectionist. You look at what you've done and you think, oh, it's really brilliant. I've done well there, but can I do better? Yeah, I can, like improving it. Yeah, I agree with you. I just wanted to say thank you so much for being here today and talking to me. I really enjoyed it. And my favourite part was when we talked about complicated problems in like electromagnets. Brilliant. Well, thanks very much for having me. I'm glad you found it interesting and that I didn't send you to sleep, as um, I tend to with most people. My favourite bit was talking about Back to the Future. Actually, no, sorry. Yeah, that was my favourite bit. <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure. Bye-bye. That's all we've got time for this week. This week's episode is going to be loads of information to think about. Maybe the future of electricity is wind, solar, nuclear, biomass, hydroelectric power, or even a mixture of them all. I'm not sure what it will look like in the future, but what I do know is that we need to work together to make sure we have energy for the future that is reliable, safe, not too expensive, and greener. The second part of my episode on energy in August will look into this a bit more. What do you think? Join me, 
next time for another exciting episode of Jack of the Future. <laughs>